SpaceX is closing towards the seventh integrated flight test of Starship, a mission that will feature many changes compared to the previous ones. One of the major changes is the debut of the next-generation Starship Block 2 upper stage, with its first prototype being Ship 33. This prototype marks a significant milestone for SpaceX, featuring substantial design improvements. Ship 33 completed its static fire testing this past week, a major milestone ahead of the launch. On Sunday, December 15th, the ship successfully conducted a full-duration static fire test, igniting all six Raptor engines for approximately 10 seconds while being secured to the test stand. This milestone marked the first time a Starship Block 2 vehicle had ignited its engines. A key focus of this test was to validate the redesigned propellant delivery system, which incorporates a newly engineered downcomer and other internal components, ensuring efficient and stable propellant flow to the engines. Additionally, the test also served to validate the structural integrity of the Block 2 vehicle by subjecting the ship's structure to the intense forces and stresses generated during engine operation. The next day, on December 16th, the ship performed a single-engine static fire, and it lasted for about six seconds. This test of the Raptor C-level engine was intended to simulate its ability to restart in space after periods of shutdown. Such restarts are essential for orbital adjustments, including tasks like changing the rocket's trajectory, aligning for docking, or preparing for re-entry. One might wonder why SpaceX tested a seal level engine rather than the vacuum-optimized Raptor, which is specifically designed for space operations. The choice likely comes down to versatility and redundancy. While vacuum engines are ideal for propulsion in space, seal level engines play a crucial role during atmospheric phases, such as controlled re-entry maneuvers or landing burns. Testing their ability to restart ensures Starship can safely return to Earth or perform last-minute course corrections during descent. Also, in case of vacuum engine failures, sea level engines can serve as a backup for in space maneuvers. Ensuring they can restart in a vacuum provides a layer of safety and operational flexibility. And most importantly, sea level engines are easier to test on the ground compared to vacuum optimized variants, which require specialized facilities to simulate space like pressures. After the conclusion of the static fire test campaign, Ship 33 returned to the build site and entered Mega Bay 2. The ship is currently placed on a processing stand to undergo final inspections, hardware checkouts, and any necessary repairs or modifications ahead of Flight 7. Ship 33's partner, Booster 14, completed its static fire testing nearly two weeks ago and is also undergoing preparations inside Mega Bay. Both vehicles will soon be ready for transportation to the launch site for the full stack propellant load test. This test will serve as the final verification of system integrity and performance before the highly anticipated mission. On December 17, the FAA issued a launch license for Starship Flight 7, confirming that SpaceX met all safety, environmental, and licensing requirements necessary for clearing the way for the launch. The license permits SpaceX to repeat the Flight 7 mission profile, which involves the Starship Block 2 vehicle paired with the Super Heavy Block 1 booster, following a suborbital flight path. However, if SpaceX introduces a new generation of ships or boosters, or if the mission profile changes significantly, the company will need to secure a new license. SpaceX has not yet set a target date for Flight 7, however, as per a recent NASA document filed with the FAA, Flight 7 could occur as early as January 11th. In its recent issuance of the Flight 7 license, the FAA highlighted a renewed focus on efficiency and responsiveness. The agency stated that issuing the license well ahead of the planned Flight 7 launch date is another example of their commitment to enabling safe space transportation. However, this timely issuance stands in stark contrast to previous delays that drew widespread criticism. Notably, the licensing process for Flight 5 in October faced significant delays, frustrating Congress members, industry leaders, and the public. Many argued that the delays stifled innovation and hindered progress in commercial spaceflight. The complexity and redundancy of the Part 450 regulations were particularly cited for creating unnecessary obstacles. In response to these concerns, the FAA announced in November the formation of an aerospace rulemaking committee to review and overhaul these regulations. The committee aims to simplify the licensing process by eliminating confusion and reducing bureaucratic hurdles. It is expected to deliver its recommendations by late summer 2025. If successful, these changes could result in a more predictable and efficient licensing process, enabling more frequent launches. Additionally, on December 13, the FAA took a significant step toward reducing regulatory duplication. The agency declared that it would accept flight safety analyses performed by federal launch ranges as part of launch license applications.
This change removes the need for companies to perform duplicate safety analyses specifically for the FAA, thereby streamlining the approval process. Launch providers, including SpaceX, had long criticized this duplication as inefficient and time-consuming. These combined efforts, the creation of the role-making committee and the elimination of redundant safety analyses, signify a clear shift toward more efficient and responsive launch licensing. This progress could accelerate the pace of commercial space flight and encourage further innovation in the industry. Apart from these big announcements, the FAA recently indicated that it is planning to approve SpaceX's proposal to increase the number of Starship launches from the current limit of 5 to 25 per year. While acknowledging potential temporary impacts on endangered species and marine habitats, the FAA determined these could be mitigated through existing regulations and consultations with environmental agencies. The agency concluded that measures from the 2022 review remain sufficient to support the increased launch frequency. A public comment period on the draft report is open until January 17, and the FAA will host in-person meetings next month to discuss potential environmental impacts. An increase to 25 launches per year would significantly enhance SpaceX's operational capacity, supporting missions such as NASA's Artemis program and other governmental objectives. The construction of the second launch pad is progressing swiftly in parallel with Flight 7 preparations. Significant work is underway at Pad B, particularly on the flame trench near the launch tower. Teams have started installing commodity pipes around the trench, which will either carry propellant or water for the deluge system. More clarity on their specific function is expected in the coming days. Last week, the first components of the flame deflector arrived at Starbase. Based on their appearance, the deflector design resembles the one used for the static fire test pad at Massey's. However, unlike Massey's single bucket diverter, the Pad B flame diverter will feature a double bucket design to better handle the intense heat and acoustic energy generated during launches. Work on the launch tower is also advancing steadily. Teams are setting up the draw work mechanism, which allows for the controlled movement of the chopstick arms up and down the tower. Meanwhile, at the Sanchez site, the orbital launch mount for Pad B is taking shape. Teams began assembling the top layer of the launch mount, which includes water-cooled steel plates. These plates utilize a high-flow water system to quickly cool the surface during ignition and lift-off, protecting the pad from the immense heat produced by the Raptor engines. Once the basic launch mount structure is complete, internal components will be installed. This includes the booster hold-down clamps and the 20 outer booster quick disconnect mechanisms. These mechanisms supply high-pressure gases to the outer engine's preburners, spinning up the turbo pumps prior to engine ignition. Additionally, refinements to the tower arms, carriage system, and ship quick disconnect are ongoing at the Sanchez site in preparation for their eventual installation on the tower. Components of the chopstick assembly structure have begun arriving at the launch site. The arms will be integrated with the carriage system on this structure before being lifted and carefully installed onto the tower. As per reports, SpaceX is advancing plans to transform Starbase into an incorporated city. This initiative aims to establish a self-sustaining community that supports SpaceX's ambitious space exploration goals. On December 12, SpaceX formally petitioned Cameron County officials to hold an election for incorporating Starbase as a city. This process involves drafting a city charter, establishing local ordinances, and implementing tax systems. Approval would grant SpaceX greater autonomy in developing infrastructure and amenities to support its operations and workforce. Currently, thousands of SpaceX employees and contractors work at Starbase, with many residing on-site. Incorporation could enhance their quality of life by providing essential services and infrastructure. Additionally, the establishment of Starbase as a city is expected to stimulate economic growth in the region, attracting businesses, and fostering innovation. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. Japan's Space One Kairos rocket suffered a dramatic setback during its second launch, failing shortly after liftoff and dealing a major blow to the company's ambitions in the competitive space launch industry. The Kairos rocket lifted off from Space Port Key in Wakayama Prefecture on December 18, carrying a payload of four CubeSats and one microsatellite developed by various customers into a sun-synchronous orbit. Initially, the launch proceeded smoothly, with a rocket following the plant trajectory during the ascent phase. However, approximately 80 seconds into the flight, an anomaly occurred that affected the rocket's altitude control, causing it to lose stability and begin tumbling. Instead of maintaining its intended southern trajectory, the vehicle veered westward. As a result, the autonomous safety system was triggered, leading to the rocket's self-destruction to prevent potential hazards. While the exact cause of the failure is still under investigation, 
A preliminary investigation points to a likely malfunction in the first stage engine nozzle or its control system, which may have caused the rocket to spiral uncontrollably. Space One expressed regret over the mission's outcome but emphasized the value of the data obtained for future attempts. Established in 2018 by a consortium of major Japanese tech firms, Space One aims to revolutionize Japan's satellite launch services by transitioning from a public to the private sector. Diki based advanced and instant rocket system, Kairos, is a four stage launcher with three solid fueled stages and a liquid fueled upper kick stage. The rocket stands at 18 meters high, is just under 1.5 meters wide, and weighs 23,000 kilograms. The rocket is capable of lifting 250 kilograms into a low Earth orbit and a 150 kilogram payload into a sun synchronous polar orbit. The Kairos rocket's first launch, which took place in March 2024, also ended in failure when the vehicle exploded just five seconds after liftoff. Investigations revealed that the automatic flight termination system activated shortly after launch due to lower than expected thrust levels, even though the rocket's hardware was functioning properly. This failure was attributed to overly conservative safety parameters, which were implemented because it was the first use of such a system in Japan. Despite these consecutive setbacks, Space One remains determined to address the issues, improve its systems, and achieve successful launches in the future. Chinese astronauts recently achieved a remarkable milestone by completing a record-breaking spacewalk from the Tiangong Space Station. The spacewalk commenced when two astronauts from China's Shenzhou-19 mission, Kaizu and Song Lingdong, exited the Wenti and Experiment Module hatch on December 17. The primary goals of this spacewalk were to install space debris protection devices and perform maintenance tasks on the station's exterior. These protective panels are designed to shield the station's thermal control equipment cables and pipelines from potential micrometeoroid and orbital debris impacts, ensuring the longevity and safety of onboard systems. The spacewalk lasted an impressive 9 hours and 6 minutes, with the astronauts successfully completing their tasks before re-entering the station. This duration eclipsed the previous record set in 2001 by NASA astronauts James Voss and Susan Helms, who spent 8 hours and 56 minutes outside the Space Shuttle Discovery during an ISS mission. The successful completion of such a prolonged extravehicular activity demonstrates the effectiveness of China's fission spacesuits and the proficiency of its astronauts in executing complex tasks in the challenging environment of space. The Shenzhou-19 crew is scheduled to remain aboard Tiangong till April next year. During this period, they plan to conduct several more spacewalks aimed at enhancing the station's capabilities and performing further upgrades. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.